just uh, saying a few words about Therese Paler um, and how uh, he's uh, so missed. Our sympathy goes to his family, to his fiance. I know many of you were friends with him, colleagues with him. He did a tremendous job covering the Chiefs, and he'll definitely be missed. Um, uh, beyond that, just commenting on uh, the Chiefs offseason, I think Brett Veach and his team have done a great job of reshaping our offensive line. Uh, obviously, we signed uh, some guys in free agency and then the big Orlando Brown trade uh, and then uh, drafting uh, Creed yesterday. I think we've, we've taken a lot of steps in, in shoring up that weakness. Uh, we've got a good linebacker, Nick Bolton, and uh, – uh, we just uh, took a defensive end who should help our pass rush. So Brett's done an all around good job, and we've still got some picks to go. And with that, I'll open it up. Let's go first to Herbie T.O.B. Go ahead, Herbie. Hey, Clark. Good afternoon. How are you? Uh, I'm great. Thanks. Hey, um, last year around this time, you, you, um, you expressed some optimism that you could have camp in St. Joe, and then eventually it didn't happen. A two part question here where are, you, where are your thoughts right now on camp? in St. Joe this summer? And, and if so, what are the, some of the logistical challenges that you have to overcome to make it happen? Yeah, so our hope and our mindset is that we will be in St. Joe for camp this year. Um, that is something that the NFL has still not made a decision on. I know they'll have to have some discussions with the union on the protocols that will be surrounding camp. Uh, so we probably won't know, you know, here for, for a month plus. Uh, but we certainly want to be back uh, up in St. Joe. Uh, it's been a great environment for, for the team. I, I know Andy and his staff really like being up there and think it's helped us be successful on the field. Let's go next to Pete Sweeney. Go ahead, Pete. Hi, Clark. Thanks for taking some time with us uh, today. <clears throat> been thinking about this recently with um, Bre Brett Veach and, and the Patrick Mahomes contract press conference. He kind of compliments you on your expertise in cat management and, and working through that contract. I know that that was a, a very big deal for the franchise. Uh, your involvement with the finance committee of the NFL and just these uncertain times with the cap, how much does your involvement maybe give you an edge when you're talking to your own GM about future plans and cat planning and team building and so on and so forth? Uh, I, I certainly think there's some benefit to being involved uh, with any of the NFL committees. I, I think uh, you just become more facile with, with the subject matter. Uh, certainly uh, on my role on the finance committee and, and also on the CEC where we deal with the, the labor issues and, and the actual uh, CBA negotiations, I, I think uh, gives me a little bit of a, a good background from a knowledge standpoint. Um, you know, uh, Brett and his team are awfully smart, so I, I'm usually trying to, to keep up with them, but uh, at least I have, have a decent background when we're having those discussions. Let's go next to Blair Kirkhoff. Go ahead, Blair. Hey, Clark. I, I don't believe we've talked to you since that night in, uh, in, in Tampa, and I'm just wondering um, how, how much that, that loss stung. And, you know, until, until then, it just seemed like everything was on a you know, it was on an uptick for, for the Chiefs over the last several years. And then, to, you know, to, to get smacked down pretty good that night. What was kind of what was your reaction to it and how much did it hurt? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think for everybody with the team, myself included, it, it hurt quite a bit. Um, you know, as uh, outstanding as the season had been before when we got to lift the Lombardi Trophy, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, last year up to that point had been even better. Um, you know, the, the 14 and two regular season record, uh, making it back to the Super Bowl for the second year in, in a row, uh, playing against a team that we had beaten during the regular season. But it was just one of those evenings where, where almost nothing went, went our way. And uh, I know there's been, you know, a, a lot of analysis in terms of, you know, what went wrong that night, but, you know, was it the offensive line? And, uh, you know, I, I'm sure that was part of it, but there were just a lot of things. And it, it was disappointing. And, uh, you know, you have to take from those experiences the motivation uh, that, that it gives you. And I know our players, Patrick especially, um, uh, took it hard. And, and hopefully that will be motivation for them and the entire organization to come back uh, work harder, uh, focus more, not rest on the laurels of having won the Super Bowl two years ago and try to get back there this year. Let's go next to Harold Kuntz. Go ahead, Harold. 
Clark, thank you for taking time with us today. Uh, my question is in regards to some of the social justice follow-ups uh, from last season. Uh, Patrick Mahomes had mentioned uh, trying to contribute to Black-owned businesses, Tyra Matthew, of course, in the community. I'm just wondering where those conversations have continued uh, throughout the process, throughout the uh, you know end of last season, end of the off season, and what more you guys are trying to plan to do uh, to help out uh, with, with those particular communities in need. Yeah. Yeah. So it remains a big focus uh, for the franchise. You know, we were able to, to accomplish some things working with the players last year around voter registration and, and getting Arrowhead turned into a polling station, uh, which was one of the important initiatives to them. You, know, you referenced one of the other areas uh, that the players and the organization want to focus, uh, which is uh, making investments or contributions uh, to minority and black owned businesses uh, to help get them back on the back on their feet, uh, given the tough year in 2020 and now 2021 that that so many businesses have had. Uh, when we start getting the players back here in the building uh, in the coming weeks, uh, when Patrick and Tyron and their teammates are, are back in, we'll we'll sit down with them and really uh, refocus on that effort. It remains something that we want to stay vigilant with uh, throughout the season and beyond. Let's go next to Matt Derrick. Go ahead, Matt. Hey, Clark, thanks as always for your time. We appreciate it. Um, I'm curious just as far as, I know it's a little bit of ways off, but for the season and as far as capacity for fans attending games, what's kind of your optimistic goal? I know the Royals right now are nearly 50%. Is, is that a good sign for you that you may be able to get 100% capacity? And related to training camp, would you still be wanting to go to St. Joe if fans could not be in attendance? Yeah, so uh, I'll start with the second question, uh, which is we, we still would definitely want to go to St. Joe. It's it's that good of an experience for the team. I think the team gets a lot of uh, a lot out of being together uh, in the dormitories, eating their meals together. Uh, I certainly hope that we'll be able to have fans uh, in St. Joe. And then turning to the season, uh, the commissioner has already been on the record and saying that the, the plan is for us to be at 100% uh, from a league standpoint. Now, there are a lot of hurdles that have to, to be jumped over between now and then. Um, it will be different uh, in different states, different markets. Uh, we'll be working uh, with uh, the health department here in Kansas City uh, to figure out uh, you know, what's safe when we get to the season. Uh, the league also will have some discussions with the union um, in terms of, of the protocols relating separating fans uh, from the players. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done, but our mindset and mentality right now is we're going to be at 100%. Looks like we've got two more hands up. We'll go Nick and then Nate. Go ahead, Nick. All right, I'm curious for you, with a weekend like this, when you get to make that call to a player to kind of make their dream come true, mm -hmm. what's, the, what's that moment mean to you on a yearly basis? Yeah, well, the, the draft is always one of the most special times of year for, I think, everybody who's involved in the National Football League. <clears throat> Your football staff has put tens of thousands of hours into the preparation, and they finally get to see who they're going to be able to add, add to the team. Um, I think it's exciting for the fans. Uh, a lot of fans follow college football. They, they have their favorite players. And uh, occasionally you, you'll, you know, get some players from local schools uh, like, like we did yesterday with, with somebody from Oklahoma and somebody from Missouri. So I think it's, you know, really, really fun for, for the fans. I, I know for the, the players, they've literally been waiting for that moment their whole life and dreaming about it since they, they played peewee football. And I don't take for granted, you know, the chance to share with those players that they're about to be a Kansas City Chief. And usually the conversations are really strange because I'll, I'll get in about one sentence and then the room they're in with all their family and friends erupts and they can't, they can't hear me and I can't hear them. But anyhow, you, you can feel the joy and the excitement. And uh, that's one of my favorite parts of the draft every year. We'll go last to Nate Taylor. Go ahead, Nate. Hello, Clark. Good to see you. Um, you mentioned a little bit the the process and I know you're in the room uh, that leads up to this weekend um, but I just wanted to get your perspective of maybe what fans don't realize that guys like Tim Terry, Mike Bergazzi, Ryan Poles, uh, the work that they do to have to help you guys have success just what of that group uh, impresses you knowing to get them uh, getting to know them over the course of these last uh, several years and just what they do uh, to give you guys a, an opportunity to succeed in the draft. Yeah. <clears throat> 
Well, I, I think most fans see the coaching staff and the importance of having a great head coach and great, great assistants uh, that teach the players and coach them on, on Sundays. But that, that football operations staff that includes your GM and your assistant GM, uh, their college scouts, their pro scouting coordinator, all those people are equally important. And they're really doing the dirty work behind the scenes, uh, especially the scouts who are out on the road. I mean, they, they spend almost a full year out there driving from school to school, uh, staying in very unglamorous hotels so that they get a chance to, to evaluate the players uh, on campus, uh, get a chance to, to test them, get a chance to talk to their uh, coaches, to their teammates, to really find out, out about them. And, and that work is, is absolutely critical. And uh, if, you, if you don't have a good team doing that, you're going to make mistakes in the draft. If you make mistakes in the draft, uh, you, you can maybe survive one year, but that will eventually ca catch up with you. Uh, you know, more importantly is, is that you hit some home runs in the draft. And draft guys like Patrick Mahomes, right? Uh, you know, guys who can come in and literally tra transform your franchise. And so uh, the tens of thousands of hours they spend, um, I can't speak high, highly enough of the importance of that to helping an NFL team be successful. And our group has really done that uh, over the last uh, six to eight years. Clark, we really appreciate the time. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks, guys.